Thank you uh, very much. I'm absolutely delighted to participate in this Innovation Summit. Today, I plan to share with you some, some remarks about the impact of uh, technological surveillance, in particular technology disruption, and the increasing relevance of climate-related rela financial risks on the policy approaches aimed at uh, safeguarding the adequate functioning of the financial system. Of course, it is quite tempting to try to make, uh, mix those two uh, developments uh, together. Indeed, uh, both are among the main drivers of the most profound transformation of the global financial system in the case. And both, of course, have important implications for various uh, policy, policy objectives, including consumer protection, market integrity, and certainly as well financial stability. Yet, uh, I think it's also clear that the waste technology and climate affect, uh, climate, uh, fin climate related financial risk affect social policy goals are obviously uh, different, as should be the regulatory uh, adjustment that they each uh, require. At the same time, the, the forward looking nature of the risk drivers resulting from both supports a shift in the supervisory procedures and methods aimed at safeguarding the safety and soundness of financial institutions. So I will elaborate on those issues in, in the rest of this brief uh, presentation. So technological disruption implies, I think, three main structural changes in the market for financial services. First is the modification of the production process for, for traditional financial services, which now rely more on data, digital delivery uh, channels, as well as uh, services provided by third parties. Second is the availability of new products like digital or tokenized assets that leverage uh, more decentralized issuance, uh, trading and settlement uh, procedures. And third is the emergence of new players in the market uh, like uh, tech companies that benefit from data and technological uh, superiority uh, to compete with uh, traditional financial institutions in the provision of some financial uh, services. So those developments generate uh, certainly many opportunities. This has been expressed, I think, widely in many forums, including this one. But also, they actually bring some risks for the adequate functioning of the financial industry. And this might impede, actually, their ability to support social welfare. Yet we are still far from achieving a general consensus on what uh, the re right regulatory uh, response uh, should be. At times, and you can perceive a relatively complacent view uh, on the scale and nature of the required regulatory response. Frequently repeated slogans such as same activity, same regulation, same risk, same activity, same risk, same regulation, represent somehow a relatively optimistic view according to which the existing regulatory approaches will be roughly valid in the new technological environment if their scope of application is extended to the new products, the new production processes, and the new players. And indeed, in many cases, this adjustment of the regulatory perimeter is an essential uh, first step, but I think it may not be actually sufficient. It's often not sufficient. For instance, uh, just to put an example, so the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, quickly adapted its policy guidelines to account for the EML CFT risk posed by crypto assets. Uh, and this was done by incorporating crypto asset related service providers into the scope of application of its standards. Yet in this crypto, crypto world, uh, that, strategy, that strategy, as you all know, can hardly effectively address the risk posed by decentralized uh, platforms where transactions and backend procedures are conducted through automatic uh, protocols, smart contracts, uh, whose beneficial owners cannot be easily identified. As to new production process of regulated institutions, I think uh, the current rules uh, on operational resilience and in particular outsourcing controls clearly fall short of limiting the risk posed by most financial institutions, increasing reliance on the services like cloud, cloud, cloud computing offered by few, typically big tech uh, providers. So the large concentration uh, of this uh, market certainly calls for a direct regulatory intervention on the cloud service providers themselves and not only on the banks demanding those services. 
Finally, any new uh, entrant providing regulated services like payments or wealth management or insurance or credit underwriting is normally subject to, to corresponding activity-based uh, type of regulation. The problem is, of course, that uh, when those new players like big techs are also active in other financial and non-financial markets, there could be interdependencies, frictions, conflicts of interest across activities that may not too well uh, be addressed by activity by activity rules. When this is the case, actually, normally, you will have to consider bespoke entity-based rules for those multi-activity players. In sum, I think the technological disruption calls for a significant regulatory revamp, which entails much more than simply adapting all rules to the new technological environment. Regulation uh, may need to take new approaches and remain flexible enough to respond nimbly to the challenges posed by the rapid pace of innovation. Climate-related financial risks manifest themselves, and this is broadly agreed now, through uh, the standard risk uh, categories of prudential rules, so credit, market, operational, essentially. This could be seen as reassuring to, to some extent, right? So uh, this may be interpreted as supporting the idea that climate-related financial risk could be addressed without modifying the structural skeleton of prudential regulation. That it will be just uh, uh, about uh, revising the regulatory procedures used to evaluate and address the traditional risks in the new climate environment. I think it's not sufficiently frequently stressed that regulatory actions aim at addressing the impact of physical and transition risks on institutions, uh, balance sheets, may have actually detrimental effects on some climate-related financial risks, in particular transition risks. Uh, it's also true that to some extent, actually, the regulatory response may actually have implications and not necessarily positive implications on the ability to support a smooth transition towards a more sustainable economy. So unlike in the case of standard macro prudential measures, targeting risks posed by macro financial imbalances, uh, such as uh, the use of macro prudential measures, such as a carbon penalization factor, for instance, which aim at increasing banks' resilience against climate risks could well amplify transition risks. And this poses policy trade-offs and technical challenges that severely complicate the adequate design of uh, prudential policies targeting climate risks. For what I have already said, I think it's clear that the new structural challenges faced by the financial industry need to be addressed uh, with uh, an ambitious regulatory reform package. In other words, an adjustment in the, in, in the margin of the current rules is unlikely to, to sufficiently protect the, the, public, the public interest, the public uh, objectives. Actually, I even believe that uh, introducing new, well-defined rules that attempt to directly address all relevant financial stability implications of developments such as uh, the technological disruption and climate uh, change would hardly, enough, would hardly be enough either, right? Um, the policy response should also include an adaptation of oversight uh, procedures. And this is very clear in the, in the area of banking regulation. The main channels through which technological developments affect banks' safety and soundness are probably the challenges they pose to preserving banks' uh, operational resilience and the sustainability of banks' business models as they face, face that tougher competition from new, typically, tech players. While those risks could eventually affect banks' solvency, they cannot always be effectively addressed by standard capital requirements. There is simply no sensible capital levels that could fully compensate by the disruption created by the inability of a bank to be able to continue to offer critical services to their clients. And if you look about, talk about business model sustainability, it's the same thing. Basically, you identify that the bank is unable to deliver a sufficient return to their uh, equity holders. This can hardly be addressed by just requiring the bank to hold even more equity. 
In principle, calamity-related financial risk impact on, on credit market and operational risk could justify an additional uh, capital caution. However, risks derived from banks' exposures to dirty firms or, or, or sectors normally materialize over long and uncertain horizons. That, that means that the largely backward-looking methodologies used to calculate the required capital coverage for specific risks may not be actually fit for, for purpose when addressing climate-related financial risks. Moreover, I think it's difficult um, to justify asking banks actually to hold more capital in order to cover you know, materialist, uh, cover some risk that will only materialize typically once most of the affected exposures have already expired. And when actually the relevance of those risks could actually be successfully mitigated by adequate management, management uh, actions. Therefore, I believe that increased uh, importance of both technological uh, and climate-related risk uh, point uh, to the need for a supervisory approach uh, in which the role of direct risk mitigating management actions will be enhanced. So rather than focusing only on uh, banks' loss absorption capacity to, to withstand adverse developments, the main objective should actually be just to promote man management ac actions able to significantly reduce the frequency and the severity of the distress episodes. A certain number of instruments, such as cyber resilience tests, uh, scenario analysis, or potential stress tests, could be deployed with different purposes and different horizons uh, to support supervisors when they uh, perform that task. Moreover, I think Pillar 2, the Basel framework, already allows uh, supervisors to impose, in addition to capital add-ons, qualitative measures with a sufficient degree of uh, intrusiveness aimed at improving the risk profile of the institutions when this is actually required. Therefore, I believe that while quantitative and qualitative, uh, quantitative and uh, capital and liquidity requirements need to remain at the core of the prudential uh, framework, new developments such as technological, the technological disruption and increasing relevance of climate-related financial risk support, they move towards, towards uh, probably more intrusive, uh, more forward-looking, certainly, approach, but also a much less capital-centric type of uh, framework. Capital, for sure, should remain at the core of the regime. It is absolutely a necessary condition. So using capital is a necessary condition, actually, just to promote a safe and sound financial system. But certainly, it is for sure to ensure that this is going to be the case without actually considering other actions aiming at actually ensuring adequate risk management by financial institutions. Let me stop here and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.